Hey, how are you, everybody? Welcome to the Stuttering John podcast. So happy to be here. Well, it's true. L.A. is known for its road rage. While I was driving home, I don't know what I did, but this guy comes alongside my Mercedes. He's in a silver GT Mustang and wails a bottle of water at my window. So then I start chasing him. And this white thing. I start chasing him. And it's like a police chase. And the guy is, keeps going away. He's just like, uh, it's like this little overweight fucking short guy. And he's all tough guy until I, he saw how mad I was. But anyway, without, let me just get a sip of my zero Mountain Dew. And my next guest will be very used to why you can't see something green when you're using the green screen. Ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to have this guest on. He not only is a friend, I watched him on TV. <clears throat> I respect his work. We both share the same love for cinema. Let's welcome Richard Roper. How are you, buddy? John, how are you? <laughs> Good. I love having you on, Richard. Listen, I got to I got to jump in right away. Uh, you also have to mention that I was actually on the Tonight Show a few times when you were writing some material for some uh, bits I was doing with Jay. I remember it was like it was like being on your show of shows in the 50s. We were doing like a run through and then you'd come out with these notes and then you punched up some lines. It was very cool and I was very proud of you for that uh, that stretch of your career. Oh wait, did I direct you in like a cold open? Uh, a couple of times, yeah. We did a, a film festival thing one time with some student uh, filmmakers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, we actually can say that we've not only been friends and talked to each other and stuff, we've actually worked together. <laughs> yeah. But I just, you know, every time the Academy Awards are coming, I'm like, I got to get Richard on. I got to talk to you about film. I took notes because there's so, so much to get to, so little mm -hmm. time. I'm sure you don't have that. How much time? Do I have with you? You you asked for an hour. You got an hour, my friend. Okay, so the timer's on. You got okay. 57 minutes now. We blew three minutes with this yeah, nonsense so. at the start. By the way, <laughs> what did I win that bottle of champagne for? Was that a Cubs bet? Oh, man, what was that for? You might have outpicked me for the Oscars, maybe. I don't know, but you did send it. And I, I was going to say, if you want to try and win something back, we can say who has a better record, Yankees or Cubs or something like that. Well, I can tell you this much. You know, I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, so yeah, I'm a White, White Sox fan. Can yeah. I tell you, John, right now, the White Sox are probably the worst run franchise they all, in all they sports, <laughs> which is why I'm now wearing my nice L.A. Dodgers. Uh, this is my, you know how they used to say a side piece, like if you had someone on the side back in the day? Yeah, the, the Dodgers have always been my second team or safety school would be a nicer, a more polite way of putting it. Your safety school. So I, when I was growing up, the Sox were pretty good, but I always was fascinated by the Dodgers. You know, they had, yeah. this is back in the 60s and 70s. And they had they always had good fielding teams, good base running teams. And I, that's the way I was taught to play the game. Uh, Maury Wills, you know, players like that. So I love the Dodgers. I watch them all the time. Uh, but my Cubs are actually going to be pretty good this year. Uh, but I wouldn't bet the White Sox to have more wins than the Bears <laughs> this year. I mean, they're going to win like – they'll be like if they win 50 games. Who? The Cubs or the White Sox? The White Sox. Oh, sorry. So, I'm just kidding. Yeah. The, the, the Cubs are good. The Cubs are, are good, and they're a lot of fun uh, to watch. Listen, I'm a White Sox fan. You know what it's like. If you're born a fan of something, you can't switch midstream. You've moved you from one coach to the next. You didn't all of a sudden – I don't see you with your Lakers hat on all of a sudden. You know, oh. I, I – you can't you don't do make that. the buckers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Clyde the Glide Frazier, Earl of Pearl Monroe. Yep, yep. And uh, um, Phil Jackson, who I directed also in a cold open with Adam yep. Sandler. Yeah, and Phil, of course, if, folk, if folks don't know this, uh, you know, played for the Knicks. Uh, then, of course, was the coach of the Bulls. A lot of people saw the Last Dance uh, documentary. Uh, I got to know him because I actually shared an agent with him when he was coaching the Lakers. So I would get to come out and 
not not quite be in the front row. I mean, that's for, you know, that's for J-Lo and Ben or whatever, but get some great seats. And, you know, I, I'm like you, too, even though you know, I'm a Chicago guy. I'm a sports fan. I don't have this whole hatred for I don't hate the Cubs like a lot of White Sox fans do. Yeah. I'm like, I don't hate the Mets. Know, yeah. I, you know, I, I want to if, if it's the Cubs and, and the Indians in the World Series like it was in 2016, I'm not going to root against the Cubs. I got friends and family members who are Cubs fans. I want them to be happy. Yep. Yep. And uh, the, the other thing, the, the, getting back to your point of the second team in football, I'm Giants mm. first and Jets second. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, you know, well, you know, and, and of course you get all these rivalry rivalries and like with the bears, it's the Packers and it's kind of fun, but I, you know, you get to a certain point in your life, you want your teams to do well, but I, you know, I'm not that, I can't wear a 21 year old Jersey, John. I just, you know what I mean? You see, and I, I don't begrudge anybody who wants to do that, but if you want to, if your, your listeners want to do something fun, just Google like, uh, any 1960s or 90, you know, Google Willie Mays, for example, and every picture of Willie Mays when he's on the Giants, of course, in the stands, everybody looks like an FBI agent from an Oliver Stone movie. They're all wearing hats and ties and the women are in dresses. Nobody was wearing a Willie Mays jersey except no. for Willie Mays. Yes, I know. <laughs> oh, you would love this. I, I want to bet from a guy at the pub Mm -hmm. On Jackie, it was Jackie Robinson's day, and and he's from England. And I said, I'll make you a beer bet, you know, so we'll have a pint mm -hmm. bet. I'll bet you that a number um, 42 will hit a home run today. Oh, no. <laughs> and he, and of, of course, the guy 42 hit it to home run. He goes, oh, shit, how'd you know that? <laughs> And then later on, he finds out, oh, motherfucker. <laughs> it's Jackie Robinson day, right? Jackie Robinson you know what? Day. I could tell you that oh, a similar story, though. I went to a White Sox game. This was around 2005, 2006. And they had just instituted that. Everybody wears the number 42 thing on Jackie Robinson Day. So at the time, A.J. Pruszynski, who people, a lot, of, a lot of folks know now, he does a lot of broadcasting. But he was the catcher on the White Sox the year they won the World Series. So yeah. I get to my I had season tickets at the time, John. I settle in with my girlfriend and I go, Who's this number forty two catching for the White Sox? Did they bring up some new guy? And then I then I looked out and I saw because you could only see the back of his jersey, you know. Yeah. And then I see the guy coming up for the Angels, and I'm like, oh, I, I knew that everyone. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> what did you say? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, who's this new forty two guy? <laughs> so Richard, yes, yeah, sir. Uh, this is the surprise of the year in film for me, and I'll say one word: mm. Barbie. Yeah, you know, you know, here's the great thing about that, John. And I'm sure you got a kick out of this too. I, I, listen, I first of all, I want to preface by saying I liked the film. I thought it was a clever way of telling this story. It looked really cool. Margot Robbie looked, you know, it was a perfect Barbie, Ryan Gosling. The fact that it became this like cultural and sociological study and and men were being offended by it, I thought it was insane. And you know, when people said, oh, well, Greta Gerwig should have been nominated, I'm like, well, which one of those directors were you going to push out of the way? No offense to Greta Gerwig, but you're saying, like, Killers of the Flower Moon should step aside for Barbie, Oppenheimer. Yeah. And same thing with Margot Robbie. She's a great actress, but if you look at what she did compared to what Emma Stone did yeah. or what Lily Gladstone did, uh, I think it's great that it made a billion and a half dollars. It got people going back to movies because they wanted to see it. But it, the thing that really amused me was like these supposed tough guys, you know, who like did 70 minute podcasts. Yeah, I was saying, saying like, oh, you know, and my favorite, I think, was I, I, this was, I believe, Bill Maher, uh, who was like, you know, the Mattel board isn't all male anymore. You know, that wasn't a, a, an accurate reflection. And I'm like, well, Will Ferrell's also not the CEO, Bill. It's a movie. You know, <laughs> I remember I'll tell you this, this quick anecdote from 30 years ago. Michael Keaton was doing the Batman movies and, and there was all the leather and everything. And everybody kept asking about all the symbolism with him and Michelle Pfeiffer and Catwoman and was Batman this and was he representing the dark side of humanity? And I'll never forget, Michael, this was at a press conference and Michael Keaton said, you know, I want to tell you guys something. There's life and there's movies. This is a fucking movie and the rest of you need to get a life and just enjoy the movie and leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. But I'll tell you, because yeah. I wasn't going to see Barbie. Because I'm yeah. like, why am I going to see Barbie? I yeah. mean, you know, and my youngest son, Oscar, mm -hmm. who, who just turned 18, he's, he saw it twice. Wow. And he goes, he goes, Dad, 
it was it's great. And I go, all right, Richard, I gave it a shot, not knowing it's back. I laughed hard at it. I laughed my ass off, and I didn't expect to find it funny, and I'm laughing. It, you know, <laughs> that's the key, John. It's Greta Gerwig and her partner, her husband, Noah Baumbach. The screenplay is the most impressive thing about Barbie because it's really funny. And it's kind of dark. You know, there, there's that famous scene at the party, and she's like, Do you ever think about dying? I mean, when that when I saw that at an advanced screening, I was like, okay, what in the F is just happening here? And th they had so much fun with the constructs and stuff. But I don't, you know, listen, sometimes they kind of pounded us over the head with the, you know, the patriarchy and all that and the big speeches yeah. and everything. But I also cracked up, John, when some people were like, you know, man, this this movie really is unfair to Ken. And it really makes Ken. And I'm like, OK, not to get into doll history, but if you look back at all of the Barbies from when you I'm a little older than you are. But, you know, when we were growing up, they had Barbie started off as a, as a model. Then she was a stewardess. But then by the 70s, Barbie was a doctor. Barbie yeah. was a teacher. Barbie was a nurse. Ken never even had a job. No. <laughs> they never they never developed the Ken character. Ken was no. always the arm candy for Barbie. So when people say, well, they don't they didn't do Ken justice, they go, there's only Ken never they never had astronaut Ken. No. You know, psychology. G.I. Joe, maybe. <laughs> yeah, G.I. Joe was the man. Now G.I. Yeah. Joe, because he wasn't just a G.I. Joe, you know, he could be all these different things. And there were other, they were, you know, kind of knockoffs and stuff. But I like me, I used to like Big Jim. You would because because you would hit the button in the back and he would go like that. Yeah, well, remember like the Seinfeld did the episode because Jerry said he always got the knockoff, you know, because he you know Army Pete or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also cracked up that people were offended on behalf of Ken as if he's some biblical New Testament character with a rich history that had been erased. And the funny part was. If you watch the movie closely, and again, you know, we're, you know, I, the fact that you and I are doing a deep dive on Barbie is something I never thought would have happened. And I've known you 25 years, but here we are. But, you know, the, the, the fact I think the movie works is because Ken starts as this preening buffoon and gets too full of himself, but then is vulnerable. And then, yeah. like, you know, kind of realizes that he's got to be more than, you know, that I'm just Ken. You know, that's the thing where he comes to this realization. I want to be more than this. And then they all had all the different Ken's basketball Ken and everything. So he kind of gets his due. That was the that was the great thing about the screenplay. It was just so it, both of the characters became so endearing. And you know, Margot Robbie was great, but I think she'd be the first to tell you that the idea that that was an Academy Award winning performance on the same level as Catherine Hepburn in her prime. No, it, it, people should relax. But I thought it, I thought it would have I thought it would have got the nomination for Best Picture because just because it was so different, you know. Well, you know, that's, it, yeah. And, you know, it, it, listen, I think it got six, I want to say, John, six or seven Academy Award nominations. And, you know, I, as I was saying at the time, because everybody kept asking me, I'm in the build-up about the snub of Barbie. Like, like, and I said, well, first of all, let's keep, here's something to go a little bit into the back, you know, pull the curtain back, John. When the nominations, when the Academy, the Academy's got about 11,000 members, okay? Yeah. When they choose the nominees, you only get to pick in your category. In other words, editors nominate editors, cinematographers yeah. nominate cinematographers, actors nominate actors. And then after the five nominees, or in the case of Best Picture, 10 have been chosen, then the entire Academy votes. So when you say that Greta Gerwig got snubbed for Best Director, it was her fellow directors yeah. who didn't put her in there. Now, she might have been their sixth choice, yeah, but she didn't get snubbed by the Academy or the entire, you know, society of Hollywood. Margot Robbie didn't get nominated because her fellow actors didn't think it was one of the best five performances in her yeah. category. Simple as that. So, the, I mean, and, and, you know, when you're Margot Robbie or Greta Gerwig, you know, they've already won the life lottery. They're incredibly talented, smart, successful, wealthy. The movie's done a billion and a half dollars. I don't think Margot Robbie woke up the morning she didn't get nominated for best actress and said woe is me you know they were they were less upset than a lot of people seem to be on their behalf about it yeah but i also thought it was a great premise that it's from a young girl's point of view like you know it was, yeah. you know because barbie touched so many of them that that was a lot these you know these children's lives were well, barbie you know well that was the great thing when the, you know the brilliance of her going into the real world 
and we see that she thinks she's going to, in her mind, in the Barbie world, it's always still 1970. So she thought she was going to be a, a hero. And then she meets these young girls and they make fun of her. <laughs> and her mother's like, her mother played with Barbie. She didn't get it at all, you know, and they, they did, a, they, they, you know, did a lot of great stuff with that, but you know, this too, you're a dad, you know, you can't interpret every single thing. And that, you know, if your kid at some point likes ballet or if wants to play with a, an action figure, it's okay. Yeah. You know, and, and the people got, are, were so threatened by the idea yep. of Barbie that they were missing the whole joke of the movie. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this movie's about you. If you're threatened by this movie, that's why this movie exists. <laughs> great, great point. That's a great point. <laughs> but um, uh, okay, enough about Barbie. Yeah. Uh, although I did love that they didn't have any genitalia, just like the dolls, and and they and they Amazing. never had sex. Ken always has to go home. <laughs> well, when she says to him, like when he's, he's like, "I'd like to spend the night," and she goes, "What will we do?" And he's like, "I don't, I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we would do, actually. And they can't even kiss. They have to kiss. <laughs> yeah, uh, all of that was so, you know, the look of the film, too. You mentioned I me. Mean, it's a great looking film. And all yeah. the little details, like when she finally lets her heel fall because her, her feet have, and every woman in the world, and some man, whoever wants to, you know, is relating to that going, yeah, that's what my feet feel like in those damn shoes, you know? <laughs> so now, Robert Downey Jr., was that, like, really the Academy Award for all his Full body of work, or did he deserve best supporting for? Oppenheimer? Yeah, great question, John. I mean, listen, I think he was really good in Oppenheimer, but if if Robert Downey Jr. had won Best Actor for Chaplin, for example, yeah. I don't think he would have won this year. But he hasn't won, as you know. And so it was definitely body of work. I personally think that his is the best performance in any superhero movie. His portrayal of Tony Stark, Iron Man. Uh, Iron Man yeah, you know, there's a prejudice in Hollywood again among the Academy about superhero movies. But yep. you know, the thing about Tony Stark, John, especially in the first movie, but even going on, you know, when we first meet this guy, he's one of the worst human beings in the world. He's an international arms dealer, he's an addict, he's a womanizer, he's rude to people. And the arc by the end, when we lose route, you know, his character, he's a father, he's a loving husband, he's a loyal friend, which he always hadn't been. And Tony Stark, it's very different, you know. Thor is always Thor, right? He's always got all those incredible powers. Superman's yeah. always Superman. Even yeah. when he's at, at Clark Kent, he has all those powers. Tony Stark's just a guy inside a suit. So yeah. he's playing a guy inside a suit who only has superpowers when he puts the suit on. You know, when he says, I am the suit, and the suit is, the suit is me. So the, the performance there was amazing. He never got nominated. So when he did get nominated for Oppenheimer, Hollywood loved a comeback story. As you well know, there was a time where Robert Downey Jr. couldn't even get insured. Yep. to be on a movie set where it was a big risk for John Favreau to get him into Iron Man. He had, and now he's this guy, you know, he makes it, he, we see him, he, him with his kids. He's been married to his wife, Susan for 20 plus years now. Hollywood loves all, all the comeback elements of that story yes. as well. Yeah. Well, I, like I'm waiting for Tom Cruise to get the same kind of Academy award because he's been snubbed and he's had yep. some great performances and I yes. can't believe he hasn't been nominated for a, a few good men. I mean, yeah, and he has. You know, he, he was nominated for Magnolia, I believe, for Born on the Fourth of July. But as yeah. you said, he hasn't won. A lot of times, John, with these actors who have everything, when they've got the great looks and the leading man things. I mean, you look at, for example, Paul Newman. He won for The Color of Money, right? Yeah. Um, which is a a great film, but is yeah. about his fifteenth best performance. Cool <laughs> Hand Luke and HUD. I think the best movie. His my favorite uh, Paul Newman performance is in. The Verdict, 1982 film, where he plays the you know the the, the lawyer who has one last chance at redemption, and it's a brilliant film. Yeah, Al, Pac Al Pacino won for Scent of a Woman. He didn't win for Godfather, didn't nope. win for Serpico, didn't win for Dog Day Afternoon. You know, even Brad Pitt, and he's a younger guy, but you know, and he was great in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But that was another example of like this guy's done 25 years of box office success. Great, you know, probably a little bit underrated because of how good looking he is. Yeah. And then he gets the supporting actor. So that happens a lot in Hollywood where they say, you know, maybe this is the one shot for we, we got to make good on this stuff. It, it, nobody can tell me that they think that the best performance of Val Pacino's nothing against scent of a woman, but it's yeah. kind of, you know, it's a little hokey. Yeah, yeah. Lone, wow. Wolf, Lone Wolf, thanks for becoming a YouTube member. <laughs> this is how this works, just so you know. <laughs> so if people want to ask you a question, uh, 
uh, see, like, the, you know, it'll be, they'll pay to ask it. So this is a good guy. This is Dick. Uh, thanks for the five skull, <laughs> Richard. You're one of the few people to replace an iconic person and hold your own. Love hmm. watching you with Ebert as a kid. Why well, no Southside ac uh, accent? He's from Chicago as well. Oh my! Well, first of all, thank you because it's. I, I think I still have one now. Compared to some of my friends, some of my friends that you know, Da Bears, that whole skit. That's like a documentary for me. You know, the, the way they talked. Uh, you know, George Went and and all those guys. It's funny you mentioned that because actually one of the first reviews that came out after I got the job with Roger Ebert was very complimentary to me, but said his South Side accent is very distracting and he should go <laughs> see a voice coach. So thank you very much for that. I, I think, yeah, probably years of radio and podcast. John knows how this works. You probably, I get a little bit more of a, you know, you become this generic voiceover guy, you know. I lose a but, New York accent all the time, you know. Yeah. Like, like on the Tonight Show, I didn't even like on the announcers. You didn't even hear it anymore. Well, it's interesting too because, like, when you see, uh, you know, the Ben Affleck movies, and I think talk about you know a great director when you look at you know the Town and Gone Baby Gone films like that. And you know, sometimes people are saying, "Oh my God, they're overdoing it with the Boston accents." I'm like, "No, they're slipping back into their natural way of talking." That's how Casey Affleck actually talked growing up. That's you know, how they all and, talk in Boston. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you you can't really do an exaggerated Boston accent. <laughs> And I say that as someone who loves, I love that Boston accent because it, 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 it's, it's a little bit, even if they're not Irish, it reminds me of, you know, there's a little bit of poetry to it, but also they're always seeming to ask you if they want to step outside and settle this. Even if they're saying, God bless you. You're like, what do you mean by God bless you? What, I, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> got to pack the car. Yeah, yeah. All that good stuff. Wicked smart. <laughs> um, Dick, you're 89 again. Thanks for five. I remember when I was a kid, you were the only film critic who had the balls <laughs> to give the Jackass movie a good review. Everyone else trashed it. That's that's really thanks for mentioning that. You know, the way I looked at it was listen, they're telling you in the title of the show and the movie who they are. They're a bunch of jackasses. But I looked at it as basically a documentary about a dozen friends who were willing to do anything and were having an amazing time doing it. So it, you know, it's very specific to the time. Although some people, you know, a lot of people are now doing these stunts. Uh, you know, in their backyards, these viral videos where they jump off, they try to jump into the pool and they hit their head on the pavement. And I'm like, you know, if you if you learned anything from Jackass, it was don't be like those guys. Don't try to be like them. <laughs> I know. Um, this is uh, oh, so I did want to. This is so surreal, and I'm going to tell you this, Richard. Mm. Now, Quentin Tarantino, I would say, is one of the best directors that we have in the business i mean yes. you know i mean he 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 kind of is a hitchcockian type you know like yeah. he does things one of my favorite things i don't know if you know this richard but in pulp fiction right before john travolta gives uma thurman the adrenaline shot mm -hmm. in the foreground there are two board games on the shelf what do you think they are oh man is it like operation is that one of them operation and life Oh, and it's great. so like Hitchcock. It's so film. Like, you know, that's what they do in films. It's almost like he's poking fun at that's what they do in films. You know? 100%. Well, you know, over the year, first of all, I agree with you. I think, you know, he's what I call like an event director. There's 25 directors when they're making a movie. They're the bigger star than, you know, Christopher Nolan, obviously, and Spielberg. And M. Night Shyamalan, when he first came yes. out with, yes. with uh, you know, The Sixth Sense no. and Unbreakable and Signs. Uh, I've come to really once upon a time in Hollywood might now be my favorite Tarantino movie. And I know you'll, you love this is one of the great things about it is every single time, whether it's Brad Pitt in the car or Margot Robbie or Sharon Tate with uh, Roman Polanski, the radio is actual sound bites from actual radio broadcasts yeah. of the time, you know, yep. from what 1969. Right? So you hear, you see, you know, you hear ads for the the Illustrated Man, which was a movie that lasted. It was a Ray Bradbury famous story, but it was not a hit movie. But you hear the the actual radio advertisement for that. You hear the the the, the lead ins to the songs by the DJs from the station. I love all those that the, that that touch. You know that that Tarantino always does. They did starting with Reservoir Dogs with K Billy Super Sounds. You know, and Stephen Wright, and the, you know the the songs that were you know that became such a fabric of the movie. Um, but to get into Quentin, mm -hmm. I wrote a, you know, uh, I think me and my partner, you know, one of my writing partners on tonight's show, or it was just me, but I wrote a sketch for Jay and Quentin. It was a cold open. Cool. 
So I say action, I'm directing it, and Quentin goes off script and does like a minute and a half ad lib. <laughs> and I go, cut. I go, Quentin, this is 30, 40 seconds. You got to stick to, you have to stick to the script. He goes, okay, John. Okay, John. You know, I got it. And then, and then, and then I start walking out of the room, Richard, and I swear to God, I'm saying in my head, I can't believe Stuttering John is directing yeah. Quentin Tarantino. And he took your note. He took your notes. So that, yeah. yeah. No, it wow. was so Dude. surreal for me. That's a great story. I love that. And he was so respectful to me, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, he was, you know, you, you know, that's interesting you mentioned that because you I'm sure you know this too. You know, after Roger Ebert got sick and Jay was the first person to do a guest host, you know, get a, a guest uh, appearance as the co-critic. And we had a bunch of other you know, over a two year span film critics. And we had people like we had John Mellencamp. We had Aisha Tyler, but Jay was the first one. And when we did the show, they actually built a facsimile of the balcony and the bleachers backstage of the tonight show right there because he couldn't fly to Chicago, but I'll never forget. He said the same thing. He's like, this is your show. Well, however you guys want to do things, you tell me not, not the way it works on my show. And there's a great respect, I think, when you step, when I'm a guest on your show, when you're, you know, writing for somebody, that people recognize this. Like, okay, I'm your guest. Yeah. Uh, Broccoli, Johnny, you feel okay? You look very sweaty today. Yes, yeah, some guy, did you hear what I said in the beginning? Some guy yeah. threw a bottle of water at my car. I was chasing him down the whole time. <laughs> I'm glad they're uh, worried about you. Uh, when you were telling that story, I was thinking, if you haven't seen it, John, you have to watch the Netflix series Beef from last year. That's the one about... Uh, the the two drivers who get into a road rage incident and it, it won like a bunch of Emmys and acting awards it's called Beef on Netflix. But it's a cautionary tale for you, my friend, because it's one little incident and then their entire lives are turned upside down. Yes, and uh, Broccoli, I would like to have Richard be my number one for dinner at the Belmont Tavern. There's this place in Jersey, Richard. It has a dish called Chicken Savoy and I'm taking a few of the guys that, you know, always put me, um, you know, give me some good uh, um, super chats. That, that's what these are called. Yeah, then I'm taking yeah. some of the guys there. Uh, that's cool. Spectre, thanks for the 20 bucks. <laughs> John, what an amazing guest is Richard, uh, a Back to the Future and Creep Show fan. Thanks, John and Richard Skull. Thanks, Spectre. Uh, yeah, Creep Show's amazing, uh, you know, ahead of its time and Back to the Future. You know, the great thing about Back to the Future is it had such a great spirit to it. And like every other time travel movie ever made, it really makes no sense because you can't make sense out of time travel. No, you know, I'm and you have to, on this you, ha you have to just go with it, you know, and I love the fact that but Back to the Future, there have been thousands of at least hundreds of movies about time travel and all that kind of stuff. I still think is the gold standard because they're kind of aware of that, you know, because and I love the idea. They always have this rule in these time travel movies that you can't change events because if you change who made that rule, maybe you should change event. They're always like, if you go back and kill Hitler as a 14 year old, it'll end up in a worse world war. And I'm like, well, let's take a chance. Let's see how it plays out. Let's get Hitler out of the way. Or, and you can't see your former self. Although now we've seen some versions of that. Uh, but yeah, thanks for that. And, yeah. But I, I just recently rewatched back to the future and, it's just a kind of a perfect 1980s movie. Everything it's about it. Too, who is brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, let, let me just get to one more because this is a good question. Daniel August, thanks for the tempest. I, I always do the horn that I did on Howard. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the time. What was it like working with Ebert? What's your favorite Ebert story? I'll hang up and listen. Skull. Uh, well, he was, first of all, you know, that's a great, great question. And I was actually friends with Gene as well as Roger. Gene Siskel for people who don't know, was a huge Chicago Bulls fan. And he also liked to bet on the pony. So we used to talk bulls and horse racing and go to the OTB almost before I really got to know Roger. And then Roger and I had worked together at my home newspaper where I'm still at the Chicago Sun-Times. I was doing different types of writing because he was the film critic. So when I started doing the show with him, it was kind of surreal. Like, John, I'm sure for you, like all of a sudden you're like inside your television when you're on The Tonight Show. I'm like, I felt like I was on the you know, at the bar at Cheers all of a sudden, sitting in those balcony seats. And talking about generosity, you know, here's a quick story too. You know, Roger, by the time I joined that show, Roger had become world famous. You know, uh, he did all those great skits, he and Gene with Letterman. You know, they were just household names. They were on The Tonight Show a million times. 
And the first time I started doing the Tonight Show with Roger, the producer was like, well, you know, Roger will sit in the chair next to Jay and Richard will be on the couch. And that was great. The second time they're like, okay, we'll walk out. Roger will sit next to Jay. And Roger goes, no, 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 no. Richard's going to sit next to Jay. He gets the first chair now. We're equal partners. So he's going to take most of the questions. And he was like that with everything we did. If we were at the Sundance Film Festival and someone came up from Access Hollywood, hey, Roger, I want to talk to you. He'd say, well, you want to talk to me and my partner? right and and that it elevated me to a status i probably hadn't earned yet but it also it also helped the show roger's like this show's not going to work if you don't disagree with me you you know if you just keep going oh you're the master you know and it did I, we were you know we were on for eight years before he got sick uh so that's you know that's kind of my lasting memory is his generosity of ego in a business where you don't get a lot of that he seemed like a very very sweet man and you know what was so funny richard i'll tell you when um uh gene and uh, i stutter on r so, so when i sometimes i i struggle no to say Richard, but when gene and roger hmm. came to the stern show i would pull up some of their uh reviews that howard could dispute like yeah. oh yeah i think i think either cisco or ebert gave godfather two three stars and godfather three three and a half and i and i thought you know so that we would to try and say what were you thinking godfather three was a debacle next to godfather two you know we things like this well i don't Do you know if you ever have a movie like that richard where you're just like oh yeah okay, oh maybe i Dude, missed the boat on that one sometimes i click across something you know at night and i'm like did i really give legally blonde two three stars <laughs> not the first one which was great and i'm like man i must have been in a really good mood that week it's mostly <laughs> You know, the movies I ripped, I'm usually like, yeah, I could see why. But every once in a while, I'm shocked to find out that I gave a thumbs up to something that wasn't great. Now, I don't know if you're going to remember this. When I first started coming on Howard Howard show with Roger, um, there was a time one time early on, Rob Schneider called in to, like, rip into Roger, you know, for some reviews. And it was, and of course, it was a big mistake. Even if you're a good comic and and, a, and fast on your feet, because the critic always has the final word. You yes. know, they, they, the old the adage don't you know the adage about don't don't get in an argument with someone who's got all the ink. You know, because <laughs> you're always and I'm like, dude, not that Roger would do this, but I'm like, you know, he's going to review your next movie. You know, you're not helping your cause, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you ever get actors like kissing your ass? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is the reason we always kept the show in Chicago was we didn't want to get too close to Hollywood. You know, Disney was distributing the show. They were like, boy, it'd be a lot easier. You could just come to our studios instead of having to have an entire crew in Chicago and all the logistics of that. And Roger and Gene and then Roger and myself were like, we, we want to be separate from Hollywood. You know, we want to, but you do get to know people and you become friends with some of them. But the interesting thing is to me was like when I once in a while hear from somebody who would write to me after I gave him a negative review. And I, I've told this story before, but this is a Tonight Show story. Uh, I Listen, I, I understand that a lot of people love Zoolander. I was not a huge fan of Zoolander. I know, I, I like you know, and so Roger and I both gave it two thumbs down, right? Yeah. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we were on the Tonight Show and, and Ben Stiller, who I think is fantastic oh, and, wow. a, and a lovely guy, by yes. the way, too. But... As John knows, they they had all these guest books. So if you were a guest on the Tonight Show, you signed in, you signed in, and it was really cool because you you could look in and go like, oh, three days ago, Will Smith, hey Jay, thanks for you know, like really cool yeah. thing. Years of that. So we get the guest book, and Roger he flips back and he gives the eyebrows. He goes, come on, take a look at this. And here's Ben Stiller had already signed it, and he goes, instead of writing something to Jay, he goes to Ebert and Roper, take those two thumbs and shove them up your ass. Love Ben Stiller. <laughs> Which was the greatest thing ever, you know? And Roger goes, we should bring this out on stage. I go, no, 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 no. I go, it's fine. And after the show, Ben said, you know, I'm, I guess, guys, I'm, I'm sorry. He goes, I, he goes, you know, I spent three years of my life working on that movie. And Roger goes, well, I spent 110 minutes watching it. So we're even. <laughs> <laughs> That's, those are yeah, great, great Ebert. So, and by the yeah. way. His instincts were right. Jay would have loved if he brought that out on the yeah, set. Yeah, and that's the thing about Roger. Um, he had an enormous respect for filmmakers and actors, but he didn't give a shit about, you know, like he wasn't trying to be buddy up to anybody, you know, at all. He was, you know, he would do these amazing profiles. You can look them up online back in the day where he'd spend, you know, a, a week with Robert Mitchum 
or Robert, you know, Lee Marvin, like real movie stars. Not that today's actors aren't, but it was like he was not starstruck. In fact, half the time he would say to me, who's that? Who's that? And I'd be like, that's Reese Witherspoon, you know, like the up and coming actors, because he was, you know, he'd been around for a long time. So, you know, he, the last thing he was was worrying about, like, becoming loved by Hollywood. He wanted to be respected by readers and viewers. Uh, another question. The Grim Reaper. Does Richard have a favorite screenwriter? Um, a lot of screenwriters, you know, going all the way back. You know, there's a there's a writer by the name of Robert Town. You can look up all the great stuff he did. Uh, I think in modern times, you can't deny Aaron Sorkin. I know some people say, oh, everybody talks like an Aaron Sorkin character, but they kind of really don't. But if you look, uh, to me, The Social Network is maybe the best, one of the five best movies of this century, the 24 years we've had so far. And he won the Academy Award for Best Screenplay there. And I mean, everybody's great in that. And Fincher did great direction and, and the soundtrack and the score, all of that is great. But every single scene in the social network you know just like when 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 zuckerberg played by uh uh eisenberg jesse eisenberg is looking out the window and the lawyer goes don't you think i deserve your full attention he goes you deserve the minimum of my attention right now because i, I don't want to perjure myself you know uh so i think you know i think sorkin's great christopher nolan you know people i don't know if they realize this he writes or co-writes everything too you know that's all of his great movies start with him uh writing you know i think Don't a lot of the best Cameron do it as well who's that James Cameron. Yeah. And then you just mentioned another Cameron, Cameron Crowe. You want to talk about oh, a great God, writer. Cameron. That you know, is my favorite. Cameron Crowe. That's such a great, that is such a great uh, question for your listener because Cameron Crowe, again, you know, you think of Jerry Maguire and to this day, people saying, you complete me. The yeah. human head weighs eight pounds. You know, all these lines that, you know, become part of the social, people are quoting lines sometimes from Cameron Crowe, from, uh, Aaron Sorkin without yes, even I'm realizing right. Right. It, it, isn't yeah. it true that he went back to high school and yeah there's a book called the there's a book Cameron Crowe was about Cameron Crowe was basically that young writer in almost famous, almost famous. He, was, he was writing for Rolling Stone when he was 18 19 but when Cameron Crowe in real life was 20 years old 21 it was actually called Claremont High was the actual high school I think in San Diego and he went undercover at Claremont High he changed the names of the kids because a lot of them were minors but Stacy and Brad and all of those types yeah. you see are fictionalized versions of actual students at Claremont High. Pretty oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. And and the, one of the last movies I um I um I showed my two kids where my two youngest was almost famous and they loved it. They loved almost famous. You know, I love that too, John. Uh when because there was a big thing on Twitter recently where somebody who was like 30 years old said Nobody who's my age cares about movies from the 80s or 90s. And I'm like, that, that's insane to say that. Because when you and I, when I was, you know, growing up in the in the 70s, I loved movies from the 40s and 50s. Yeah, me and too. Great movies are great movies. And I, I have a lot of friends who have younger kids. I, like, this is kind of cool. Um, I recently spoke to a, a group of high school students. So high school students right now are, you know, let's say they're 17 or 18 years old. It means this is kind of shocking. But they were born like in the late 2000s, right? I know. And this was a, a high school in Champaign, Illinois, where the University of Illinois is at. And they have a, Tarant a Quentin Tarantino film club where they all just watch movies by Quentin Tarantino and discuss them. They asked me to do a Zoom with them. Because when you think about it, for them, Reservoir Dogs is, is a movie that came out almost 20 years before they were born. <laughs> so they're, you know, that he's not really of their generation. He's an old timey filmmaker as far as they're concerned. And I love the fact that they were into everything he had done. Even the fact that you know he had written the the screenplays for True Romance and Natural Born Killers, they talked about that, and that's how he got his entree into directing. So I love it when young people are into movies that aren't just from two years ago. Yeah, I was just watching a friend of mine on his show, and he was talking about the greatest scene from True Romance was that Christopher Walken scene with the watch. Amazing. Oh no, that's from that's uh, Pulp Fiction. That's Pulp Fiction. No, no. Scene with the... is it? Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was true romance. We're talking about the no Butch, because remember Butch had. That's why Butch goes back and gets the watch. Oh, okay, that's and, right. And kills uh, Travolta. Right. Oh, yeah, you, boy, you got me. You got me going for a second. I had this recently where, um, <laughs> and this is this. I'm not making light of this, but in two in the last two weeks, we've had two smaller movies, but they're both really good. One of them is called Sleeping Dogs, and Russell Crowe plays a former a homicide detective who has dementia, and he's 
trying to reopen one last a case from the past and remember, and it's especially difficult, sort of like the M Memento movie. But then uh, Michael Keaton was in a movie called Knox Goes Away, which is about a hitman who has dementia. And as I was writing the two reviews, I kept thinking, like, am I getting the right scene right? Oh, wow. Especially in that with that subject matter. And just two years ago, Liam Neeson was in a film called Memory, in which he played a hitman with dementia. And Anthony Hopkins, of course, won the Academy Award for the father for playing a man who has dementia. And I, you know, I think the reason, if you look at those actors, the reason why they want to play those characters is because it presents such a dramatic challenge because you're, you know, going through this thing while trying to piece things together. So I, I totally get why I sometimes think about different movies and I'm like, that wasn't even it. I've, I've occasionally thought that Bruce Willis was in a movie and I'm like, that, what, wait a minute. And that's why the internet is our best friend. Yes, I know. Because when I first started off, I had to look shit up like an, on a microwave. You're microwave. Mi there I go. On microfilm. Not on a microwave. If you look something up on a microwave, you're not going to I gonna remember microfilm in the library. <laughs> when I started at the Sun Times, the Chicago Sun Times, they had a full library and a library staff of actual humans. And if you wanted to research something, I mean, you could look some stuff up. It was early, you know, internet days. The Dewey Decimal System. But you filled out a form, and then they'd give you all these files. Like, you know, when you look at movies from the, you know, like if you watch, like, Zodiac, they're all making, you're like, I'll send you a facsimile. It'll show up in 45 minutes. Oh, technology. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if you want to, you don't have to answer this, but yeah. he is a Chicagoan. Dick K nine thanks for five bucks. Richard, not to bring up pogs, but from me in Dalton, do you have any comments on oh, Dalton? God. I don't think most people know. Yeah, I grew up in Dalton. There's yeah, I've I I will I will uh, abstain from commenting other than say that I come from a an area that has long had a lot of colorful politics. You know, I live I grew I grew up John actually very near Calumet City, Illinois, which um uh, is famous for two things in the movies. First of all, the Blues Brothers are yeah. from Calumet City, Illinois. Yeah. They're my Lady of Passion or Our Lady of South, whatever the orphanage is, is actually in the movie from Calumet City, Illinois. But also, when you watch The Silence of the Lambs, they mistakenly believe that Jamie Gum is holed up in a house in Calumet City, Illinois. Oh, and remember yes. that? So yes. Scott Glenn, Scott, Scott uh, Glenn's character calls Jodie Foster's character, Clarice, and says, you know, don't worry about where you're at. We're yeah. about we're at the edge of Chicago, and then there's the famous scene where they break into the house in Calumet yes. City while she's ringing the doorbell of yep. the real Jimmy. Oh, so Calumet it. City, you know, two great mentions in the movies. And thank you for that. Unbeknownst to you, perfect segue into where I was going. Uh, in the Blues Brothers, what great film director does a cameo? Uh oh, um, is is it Spielberg? Yes, it is. Oh, it's was... And that's what I want to tell you. You know what, Richard? Now, I went to NYU film school. Mm -hmm. I am the biggest Steven Spielberg fan that could ever mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. I always compare him in a way. To, to me, Spielberg is the Eddie Van Halen mm. of directing. Like, Eddie Van Halen is, uh, you know, I don't know if you, you know, it's just yeah. so innovative. To me, Spielberg is so innovative as a yeah. filmmaker and like even when you my favorite movie is jaws just because of the way it yeah. was shot the camaraderie of those three great performances from shaw um um Scheider and dreyfus but yeah. but but spielberg and they all frowned them in nyu they're like oh come on he's a sellout and they all liked jim jarmish and godard and fellini but I love Spielberg. What yeah. do you think about Spielberg? I love the Fablemans. I love. I didn't know that about a story. Well, and you're right about the Eddie Van Halen thing, where the cliche, like the guitarist, guitarist. You know, certain comics are comics, comics, and Spielberg yeah. is a director's director. And it it's become an you know uh, the cool thing now in certain circles they call it film Twitter or whatever is to say all Scorsese can do is gangster movies. All Spielberg can do is fairy tales. And it's like, well, then you're not paying attention to the movies they've made and what they're really about. What that's like saying, that's like saying the Godfather is a gangster movie. And I'm like, there's so much, it's the great American Shakespearean family tragedy of all time, you know? Yeah. Uh, so Spielberg, you mentioned Jaws. I think he was 26, John, when he made that. And you think of, first of all, I think something like 25%, some, something like that, at least 20% of the scenes are sort of filmed at water's level. So you're yeah. getting that kind of shark's view or the victim's view. Uh, 
the, the the different camera movements, the fact that he knew, you know, people talk about the mechanical shark wasn't working. That was the best blessing ever because the scariest thing in every scary movie is the unseen and the unknown. Um, you know, even in movies like Halloween and, and Friday the 13th, once you see this big dopey guy in a mask, it's like, okay, you know, it's the, what we don't see. Poltergeist is a great example of that, you know, the clown, you know, things like that. Yeah. But the way Spielberg frames everything, and, and yes. you know, I just John, I just rewatched the other night because he's done so many this thing different types of films. You know, yeah. you could take away all of the the feel good stories, and then you're talking about you know Schindler's Lists and yes. you know, films like that. But I just recently watched The Terminal from the mid two thousands yes. with Tom Hanks, and when you watch that movie, it's 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 very much a Frank Capra corny, you know, coming to America type of story. But first of all, the cast is amazing, Tom Hanks. Stanley Tucci is the perfect foil. But, John, you probably know this. You know, they built an entire set to be an airline terminal. They didn't, they couldn't film in an airport for 30 days because people need to get to their plane. So, yeah. and it's so much of its time because, you know, the 2006, I want to say it could be a year or two of. Yes, we had cell phones and yes, we had internet, but you still had these, you know, this kind of shopping mall atmosphere at the international terminal, the Cinnabon and the, you know, and you still have some of that now, but you could buy just about anything there. Uh, but it's so, you know, the, when you look at the way that movie's filmed and realize other than a few scenes at the beginning and then toward the end, everything takes place within that world. And all those people are not AI or CGI. They're all extras. So when he moves the camera back and you're seeing 600 people flight attendants, security guards, passengers, pilots, escalators going up and down, working escalators, elevators. He created that whole world. And, and that to me is, you know, and to jump ahead, Killers of the Flower Moon, Scorsese does the same thing, you know, and Oppenheimer, no one does it. And listen, they can afford it or they can get people who back them up. But when you see Killers of the Flower Moon, there's 250 period piece cars. Yeah, you know, for the car race and then the race cars and and the villages, all of that. Those are not car. Those are not green screen. There's no. very little, you know. No. So, you know, when you look at, at at Spielberg's body of work, starting with uh, you know Duel, a made for TV movie yeah. he did, which is great, and then uh, as I Dennis Weaver, yeah, Dennis Weaver, the cloud, uh, which is yeah, uh, well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> which is kind of Jaws in, a, in a, you know on the highway. Yeah, uh, but you know, Jaws alone, and that's I, I love the fact you know, listen, Jaws was nominated and, and was you know a huge hit, but I love the fact that it's become even more revered now than it was at the time because it's again like you know, it, it won Academy Awards for sound. And when you think of the use of sound in that oh movie, God. and you know, just the little background things you're hearing, it's another like, yeah, and there's such great touches. One of my favorite scenes is when uh, Richard Dreyfus comes over and, and they're having dinner. And he brings two bottles of wine because he's got to convince them, Sheriff Brody, to come take a look at this shark. But when he pours the glass of wine, he pours like 12 ounces of the glass of wine. And, 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 and he's like, you might want to let that breathe. And Sheriff Brody's like, this, I'm drinking. Uh, but just the fact that he came over with two bottles of wine on it and just sat down and started eating dinner, too. Like, you know, because he, he was a guy with no filter. He was a brilliant, you know, oceanographer or whatever. And he he was just, he's like, that's the wrong shark, you know. <laughs> I know. Come on, let's go cut that shark open. And the but mayor. Again, ah, I'm the mayor's like, ah, it's a scratch. We're fine. We got to reopen. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I, you know, that I mentioned that I wanted to talk to you, since you did yeah. bring up Kills the Flower Moon, and I'll, which was a brilliant movie, but it was too long. And yeah. the same, yeah. I have the same feeling for Oppenheimer. Now, Oppenheimer was brilliant. Killers of the Fire Moon was brilliant. I I love them both. But, Richard, I mean, how are they expecting people to do three and a half, yeah. close to four hours to sit with that? Like, I mean, isn't that a lit? I mean, can't yeah, they? I, well, I would, I, know, out of it? I would argue that Oppenheimer probably deserved a longer running, a long running time because of so much. Now, Killers of the Flower Moon, it's a very complex and layered story but i do feel like there was a middle section where we we're kind of is it all of a sudden it almost became a gangster movie about these hits and then it was a courtroom yeah. drama and all of a sudden here's uh john lithgow and here's the you know like you know all these characters and, and famous actors showing up when sometimes the, when you do that you kind of get away from things it's interesting because I, I love killers of the flower moon but if it had been a six-part 
limited series of 40 minute episodes or 50 minute episodes i wonder if it would have won all the emmys and uh, martin listen martin scarce says he's not interested in doing that i get that no. but sometimes i think it you know they that is that option is out there now for some of these stories that maybe need if they're going to be 300 minutes that maybe it should be six 50 minute episodes and people because you know you I, listen people binge but when you binge you can take a break you can stretch your legs you can you know make a few phone calls and watch another episode the movies i saw somebody recently i wish i could give him credit i know some somebody in the film film critic community said that they should bring back the intermission you know the 15 or 20 minute intermission that they used to have you go yeah. out to the lobby you can go to the bathroom and get a snack or a drink just like they do for broadway shows you know they yeah. still do that and i think i think that would be a cool idea the theaters don't want to do that because then that's even more time before they can have the next showing of the film i know i know but that is a good point right Richard, and I know this has been a debate for a long time, but I think it's time at this point. Why not best comedy? I mean, you know, yeah. comedies get always get like never do they did they ever get even a nomination? And yeah. some of them are so well done. Like, when is it yeah. ever going to happen, or is that just not going to happen? I think uh, well, that's one of the few things I can say. The Golden Globes has always had it right to have comedy or musical, at least to have that option. Because a lot of times people who win the Golden Globe for comedy, that's they know they're not going to win the Academy Award, so they got that. And and the Academy, even though they've made a lot of changes in recent years, John and kind of tried to keep up with the times, they're still very much stuck in their ways. I think for sure there should be a best comedy because Shakespeare in Love was kind of a comedy in '95. The last pure comedy to win academy award was annie hall in the 70s right yeah. so they're not going to win ever again that's just that's how it back in the day it would you know comedies would be and they should be because as any actor will tell you they're at least as hard to do but why not just add, it's not going to cheapen the academy all 10 of the movies that were nominated this year would have been in the drama category yeah all 10 of them yeah. so why not have five comedies maybe barbie's in the comedy category yeah. and uh you know movies like that uh, and they're always, you know, in a lot of cases, they're popular. I mean, there's a new Ghostbusters. I love Bad movie. Santa. Was... Bad Santa. Well, you look at Ghostbusters 1984, best yeah. comedy. That should have won if there was a category. And I, I think they're going to, you know, they, they've talked about they're going to add a best yeah. casting category, which they have for like the SAG Awards. But I, it's still crazy to me that they don't have best stunt man. Or stunt women, I should say. Stunt oh, person. Yeah. It, really, the category should be best stunt And work. Tom Cruise will win. Yeah, right. You know, because he does his own. But, you know, it should be best. It shouldn't be man or woman. It should be best stunt work. But when you look at the Marvel movies and you look at Mission Impossible and Bond, and yeah, there's a lot of VFX and stuff, but there's still a lot of, like, especially the Daniel Craig Bond movies, man, he's out there in it, you know? And, and, and Tom Cruise, we know that. And it's such a huge part of movies and it, it's a huge part even films like the roadhouse remake that's coming out now which is you know it's not a great film and it's jake gyllenhaal and it's conor mcgregor but there are scenes where it's neither John, jake gyllenhaal or conor mcgregor because even though one's a professional fighter and one's a professional actor there's certain falls and moves you have to make that they get out of the way and the stuntmen do them yeah no and i i think they should i mean but who who's who's going to change it like who's in charge of doing that yeah, the Academy, you know, they've got a board. They can put things up for a vote. And they keep saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm like, well, you don't have the ratings you used to have. So why not make some changes? And I think they really did a good job. I, I I thought they did a good job this year. I thought it was like, I thought, it, you know, I thought it was well done. I agree. I agree. Listen, if you're going to do all 23 categories, it's going to be a little over three hours. But they move things along really quickly. And I think Kimmel has been a, a really good host because he, you know, he knows enough not to try to take over the room. He does his monologue maybe a little long, but I love Jimmy. Uh, and then a couple of little bits in between, and then you got to get right to it. You don't need, you know, these extravagant uh, delays and all this stuff. You have 23 categories to get through. Yeah, no, I know, I know. I wanted to do something I wanted to show you, but I can't find it now, of course. Anytime I, you know, anytime I look for something. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like when you're trying to find a uh, show a picture on your phone or something to somebody, it's it's it disappears all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah like like on T the Fugitive. Well, the Fugitive was one of the best movies ever, and that took place in your mm -hmm. town. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I can't find it. I don't know why. I don't know why I can't find this. Hold on one second, Richard. Bear with me. This was going to be, oh, man. Uh, okay. Now this is a. Uh, this is a very just a young actor, you know. 
I'd love to get your opinion of this, like just a, a quick snippet of, you know, of this performance. Uh, let's see. Okay. Just a quick snippet of an, this performance of this young actor. I'd love to, I'd love to get your opinion, <laughs> Richard. Mm. This uh, young actor, he's, uh, he just finds out his girlfriend is cheating on him with another woman. What the fuck is this? What the fuck's going on here? Tom? Yeah, Tom. Don't mind me, Jen. Go ahead and let the other finish. Shit. Jennifer, are you kidding me? You fucking cheating on me? Cheating on you? She broke up with you. A week ago. Jen, one fucking week? That's all it took to get over me? One fucking week? Look, Tommy, I'm really sorry. Can I talk to you about this later? Can I maybe call you? Can you call me? <laughs> You're sorry? You're sorry. Jen, how can you do this to me? What do you want me to say? This, I, I mean, like te being tears and all, Richard. She makes me feel good. Jen, this doesn't bother tears. me in the least. Are you that fucking heartless? Heartless? Give me a break. It Give you a break? How about all your fucking rules? Don't be with the same woman twice. Don't be with anyone we know. Sound familiar, doesn't it, Jen? You're fucking breaking the rules here, not me. Tom, I think you should go. Do you think I should go? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what she said. You want me to go? Jen, can you see she's playing some sick kind of fucking game? Anyway, what do you think, Richard? Uh, man, that's his Pagliacci. Have we seen such a, a tortured clown right there? What a, ama amazing, amazing work, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Tears of a clown. Have you ever had the displeasure of having to watch that? I, I, I have now. <laughs> John, thanks yeah, so that's much. That's the movie man. that I wrote and I sold to National Lampoon, believe it or not. Amazing, man. Good work. There we go. There are the balloons. And I'll there do he this. Is. And here's our fireworks. This is how nice. the computer goes. Nice. <laughs> but um, anyway, so, okay, so we covered pretty much everything. Is is there one movie that you wished um, should have been in, you know, in the best film category? You know, the, a movie I really liked and it did well, but kind of got forgotten was Air, the Ben Affleck film. We talked about, you know, the the, the story of Michael Jordan and the sneakers because yeah, right. it wasn't a sports movie. It had, first of all, it had a great cast, but it was basically the social network version of what happened at Nike, how a company exploded and captured a certain moment in time. And if people haven't seen it, really good casting. Michael Jordan's not a character at all, almost. He's in the movie for like two seconds. It's all about the, you know, figuring out the next level of how is Nike going to present itself as a brand. Air called air, really well done. And what would you say was the biggest clunker of 2023? Oh man, you know I forget those as soon as I possibly can. Man, <laughs> you know, I actually stopped do doing doing the uh, worst of the year list because I felt like in this day and age we don't need to pile on the movies anymore. So listen, I got a couple. Of, I got a couple of reviews coming up next week of some films that let's just say godzilla and kong have seen better days i'll just leave it at that oh now. god why do they keep on bringing back godzilla i didn't like one of them yeah yeah but uh all right listen Michelle, I, I, my hour's almost up i do have a bet that maybe we could do okay to get you to win back you this is an easy one i think you're gonna win okay how about we bet who has a better record the yankees or the dodgers all right i get the dodgers yes you're on all right, this is, again, for a bottle of Dom or whatever we can get. Okay, deal. Richard, so plug whatever you want. Richard, listen, you know, I know I'm a pain, and I and and I beg you to come on. All right, I don't mind. I'm such a film junkie, and I love this opportunity to talk to you about films, and I hope you had a good time. John, every time we do this, it's a blast for me. I really appreciate it. You do a great job. You know that. And, yeah, listen, I do say no to a lot of people. You know I'm not going to say no to you. Well, thank you. And you have anything, anything that you want to plug? Uh, Just, uh, you know, Richard E. Roper, as at, at Richard E. Roper on Twitter is where you can kind of keep up with everything I'm doing. All right. Thanks again, Richard. Thanks, Great my job, brother. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. The great Richard Roper, uh, great reporter, great film critic.